All right, so here's some questions that were on some previous exams. Uh, this exam will cover um, a little bit of epistasis from chapter five, and then it will also, then the most of it will be uh, linkage and mapping. And so this first question is, tells you that it's, there's some epistasis going on. And then that just puts you in that sort of mindset. Um, this doesn't say um, that the genes are unlinked, uh, but we will, I would designate that um, if that were the case. Now we could get crazy and have epistasis and linkage going on, but we'll see. Uh, but this one's pretty straightforward because it gives you all the information to begin with. So it tells you you've got a black guinea pig cross to an albino guinea pig. We know that that's going to give you a dihybrid. And if we let them, and then we look at the F1 would be that. Um, and then we say that it also says that the little a allele is recessively epistatic to alleles at the B locus. Um, so if this one has a big A and big B and is black, then these guys are going to be black. I suppose you don't necessarily know that yet. But we know that we should get this because we remember what recessively epistatic means. If we don't remember it, we can write out the whole thing. And if little a is uh, recessively epistatic to B, that means when you get little a, uh, these things get combined, and that's where the 4 comes from. So then these guys would be like this, these guys would be like this, and these guys would be black. These guys would be... because two little b's gives you brown, uh, but if you've got two little a's, it doesn't matter what's going on at the b locus, these become albino. So, that's an epistasis problem. Uh, this is another, uh, another epistasis problem. You can tell because just looking at it, you see a 12 to 3 to 1. And these are, again, involving unlinked genes. Um, I guess we would, in this case, we would know it because it, we see 12 to 3 to 1 and we get another, that means it's another variation of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Uh, also, this is a specific cross that we've seen before. So parents, white cross to green. And then we get all white. And then we get 12 to 3 to 1. And so we know that that's a variation on this theme. But in this case, these are going together to give us 12. And then we get 3, 1. Uh, that tells us it's a dihybrid cross. So we know that these guys are looking like this. And the only way to get green is our 1 16th are green. So that means these guys have to be little a, little a, little b, little b. And these guys, big A, big A, big B, big B. Because we need that to generate our dihybrid. There's different ways to do it. Um, but, and so the 12, these are white. And these are yellow. So there's different ways to get um, different things. Uh, for example, we could have done this. We could have set up a dihybrid cross like that. But if we did that, big A, big A, little b, little b, well, those would be white. And little a, little a, big b, big b, those would be yellow. So that's not what is going on here. Um, so this is more consistent with what's happening. Uh, this is dominant epistasis with, in this case, the big A is epistatic 
to the B locus. Really to alleles at the B locus. So A is epistatic. Dominant A is epistatic to B. And so it's really this genotype that is epistatic. So that's what's going on there. Then everything else is pretty much a linkage. Um, I suppose we could go a little crazy and combine the two, but we probably won't do that. For each of the following results, indicate parental and recombinant offspring, whether the genes are linked or unlinked, and if linked, the genetic distances between them. So here we have A. We have big A, big B. Big A, big A, big B, big B is mated to these guys. So those are the parents. The resulting do double heterozygote is test cross, and you get these results. So we know that these are the parents, so we know that our parentals should be big A, big B, and little a, little b. So these should be the parents, because that's how they start out here. We don't even need to know that, because the ones that are the most are the parentals. And so those are the parentals. These genes are linked because the recombinants are less than the parentals. We've got 100 recombinants over a total of 900,000, 10 map units apart. B, these are unlinked. But even though they're unlinked, we still know what the parents are because these guys started out like this. So these guys are the parents, just because of the way they were written down. Because we know we're starting with those in the parental generation. All right, moving on to uh, number three, or C, I guess. Um, okay, we'll just, all right, so this is another one that's test crossed. The trick here is that uh, we don't know the genotype. So we know that's big A, little a, big B, little b, but we don't know if it's in coupling or repulsion. So we can look at these guys. That's our parents. Recombinants. The parents are together. Is big A and big B together. Little a, little b. These are coupled. Uh, we're still having uh, 100 recombinants. Over 1,000 total. So 10 map units. And then the parents that give rise to this had to be this, because these are the parents. Meaning that this and this allele came together, and this and this allele came together. So we got a big A and a big B, which gave us this. Little a, little b, gave us this. Um, they tend to stay together. So they're called the parents, or the parentals, and then the recombinants are the other ones. If we started out like this, then the parents would be this. Parent gametes would be this, and the recombinants would be this. Couldn't be simpler. All right, so this one is drawing chromosomes. This takes practice. Um, just make sure you practice doing some of these. And this goes all the way back to the first section of the course and making sure that we put the genes on the chromosomes in the right way. So there's a lot going on here. Um, so we've got diagrams 1A through C. So these guys, the top ones are going to be different than the bottom ones. Uh, diagrams 1A through to indicate the position of the alleles in the coupled configuration. So that means coupled. See if I can make my pen a little bit smaller so I can fit these alleles in there.
so th so those go are on the top chromosome. Yeah, barely. They don't really have enough room here. So this pen's not um, not good enough. So I'm gonna I'm gonna redraw them over here. Okay, so a little more room. So we're talking about this. They're coupled because the two big letters are together and, and the two little letters are together. Um, and then in A, it's it's saying next ind indicate. So then here, so once you get them all drawn out, and they'll all, we'll draw them all the same. Uh, A, no crossing over. So what kind of gametes do you get? Only these. All right, so that's that one. B, we're also in the coupled configuration. Um, and B, it says uh, a single crossover between A, A and B locus. So there you go. So we'll get some parents. We'll get some recombinants. We'll get these kinds of recombinants. And we'll get these kinds of parentals. So that's parental, parental, recombinant, recombinant. All right, so that's this one. Now, C is a double crossover. So now we still let's see if I can fit these guys on here. A, B, put these guys on the inside. A, B, little a, little b, little a, little b. I'm going to move these over a little bit. I need to make room for a double crossover. If we do that, then we'll get this kind of gamut, good parent. Then this one's tricky, we get A, comes up, gets a little bit of chromosome up top, comes back down and reconnects with this one. So we get little a little b here we start with a big a comes down picks up a little bit of this chromosome breaks off and comes up and gets that chromosome again so that's going to be started out with a big a and then we got a big b and down here we got little a little b so all of these are parentals uh, then two is asking everything the same except now we're asking about repulsion so what does that mean it just means everything's gonna be the same it's just the things that are called parents um, gotta put them in repulsion so repulsion means that the big A starts out with a little b and the little a starts out with the big B. Because I could just write them kind of right on there like that. So they're all starting out the same in repulsion. crossing over we get these guys but now these guys are all parents because we started out that way start out together stay together they're the parentals here we've got a single crossover here so we'll get big A little b that's parental then we get big A comes down crosses over with big B that's a recombinant even though sometimes you know because we started in repulsion now these guys are together so it's a recombinant then we got little a little b that's a recombinant and then big a big e little a little a big b from there is a parental 
I'll draw this one, uh, redraw this one because I didn't leave enough room. Big A, little B start together. Little A, big B start together. Now we're going to get a double crossover. Big A, little B stay together on that top chromatid. Little A, big B stay together on the bottom chromatid because they're not involved in the crossover. That's not supposed to go all the way there, it's just connecting there. But now we got little a crosses over big B, and big A crosses over twice big A little B. You got a double crossover, and they're all parentals. A lot going on in that one. So that's thinking about what's happening with crossing over, and now how can we use that crossing over information to come up with some maps. So there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can, uh, in this, this case, there's a whole bunch of different uh, uh, two-point mapping crosses, and then all of these numbers are recombination distances. And um, by looking at those recombination distances, we can tell uh, if the genes are linked or not. And so if the recombination percent is 50, then they're unlinked. If it's less than 50, they're linked. All right, so we can just say A and B are linked. And then A and D are linked. A and E are not linked. What else is in B and D are linked? Well, if B and D are linked, and they're 20. Now these guys are, so B is probably also linked to A. Well, we already, yep, we already we saw that. And then so it's B, D, B, E not linked, B, F not linked, C, D not linked, C, E. I think those are going to be now a different, and we know that A and C aren't linked. Now we're saying C and E are linked. So we'll put those over in a different group. C and F are linked. So C and E was 25. C and F is 40. D, E is not linked, then E and F is 15. So A, B are 10, A, D are 30. So A and D are the farthest apart. And so B must be in the middle. So the two that are farthest apart are, so A and D are 30. And then B is 10 from A. And B and D are 20. So that makes perfect sense. Over here, C and F, uh, they're going to be the farthest apart because they're 40. Then C and E are 25, and E and F are 15, and that all is perfectly logical. So there's your maps. Now here's one. This one is a little tricky, uh, just to point out um, kind of another type of thing that happens with mapping. So now here we've got that G and H are linked. 35. H and I are linked at 40, but it says G and I are 50, so not linked. So that doesn't make any sense, because if G and H are linked, and H and I are linked, then G and I should be linked. And so we can think about this in a couple of ways. We could have, if we had, if we had G and H are 35, and then H and I are 40, one possibility is that I is down here, and it would be 40. But in this case, then H and I would be 5. You say, oh, well, maybe that was a typo. Oops, I'm, I'm sorry, I mean G and I. G and I would be 5. Maybe it's really supposed to say that. 
But nope, that's not the case. What we're going to do is say G and H are 35. H and I are 40. And so G and I are actually linked, and they're really 75 map units apart, but the maximum you can get is 50. So when genes are really, really far apart, then there's so many double crossovers in between there, uh, you start to get, um, you underestimate the, the real distance. And so because the maximum recombination frequency is 50, that's what it would look like. So there's your map. Then we get this one. This is a complementation analysis. And now complementation and linkage really don't have anything to do with each other. Uh, they, you could have genes that complement and are linked, and you can have genes that are complement uh, and, and are unlinked. Um, so they're really unrelated. Uh, whether genes are linked or not has nothing. This is had nothing to do with their function. And in this particular case, uh, so complementation uh, refers more to the function of the genes. What are the genes doing? And so here we have a mutagenesis experiment where we have eye color in fruit flies, and all of these things have white eyes if they're mutant. They mated all these mutants together, and then they looked to see if they were mutant or wild type, and the results are here. So, so describe the logic of this gen genetic approach. So this is a complementation test. It's done to see if mutations are in the same or different genes. If mutations are in the same gene, they do not complement. Or mutations in different genes do complement. So we can analyze these things. So down here, how many different genes uh, have been identified and how many alleles for each gene. So if we take a look up here, the way you want to analyze this is by looking at each mutant individually and seeing which genes it complements and which genes it doesn't, or which mutations it complements. So this does not complement, and so really you just want to look at which ones it does not complement. So one does not complement three, five, or seven. So that means one, three, five, and seven go together. So one, so all these guys do not complement. You notice that 3, 5, and 7 don't complement this way either, so it's, it should be consistent. 2 and 6 and 8 do not complement. And I think that's all we've got. Because, so we've got two groups, so these do not complement. So that means they're all in... Um, the genes that do not complement are in the same complementation group, so we could call that complementation group one, complementation group two, something like that. So how many different genes? Two genes. We'll call them CG1 and CG2. You could call them CGA and CGB. Uh, how many alleles? Well, for CG1, we had four alleles. Again, for CG2, we had three alleles. So from up here, because there's four different mutations that fall into that group, each is a that makes them each a mutation, a different mutation of the same gene. So they're a different version of the same gene, and different versions of the same gene are called alleles. So now we want to cross, uh, we've got mutant two cross to mutant eight. So if we look up here, 
two and eight are mutations in the same gene. So what would happen is because they're mutations in the same gene, they're alleles of each other. And so they would, when mated together, they would go across the line like that. And so each of these mutants is white-eyed. And this one's white-eyed. If we cross two of them together, the F1 would be all white. And then if we cross these together, so this is the F1, we would get all white. So this is really, so it's some kind of gene. Um, and these are alleles of each other. And, and if they're alleles of each other, then um, if you cross two of these guys together, you can only get several things. You can get 2, 2. You can get 2, 8. You can get 8, 8. But all of these are white. But what about 1 and 8? So we got mutant 1 across to mutant 8. Let's just double check to make sure those are in different genes. I'm pretty much positive they are. If we go all the way up here, we got 1 and 8. These are mutations in different genes. So now we've got mutant 1. And here we'll say um, they're unlinked. And then mutant 8 is wild type. And we'll cross this to mutant 8. But mutant 8 is wild type for mutant 1. We get mutant 1. over wild type, so we're going to get we get a gene from here and a gene from here will give us this genotype. Get a gene from here, get a gene from here will give us this. It doesn't really matter which one's on top because we're saying these genes are unlinked. Uh, we could do it with their link if they were linked. I have to tell you. Um, or somehow know it otherwise. If we get this, now we've got, if we cross two of these together, and the genes are unlinked, that means we're going to get a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio where we can get two plus alleles, and that'll be wild type. We can get a wild type allele, but be mutant, homozygous mutant for mutant 8. We could be mute, homozygous mutant for mutant 1, but have a wild type 8, or we could be mutant for both. All of these are white. So these are white because they've got their homozygous recessor for mutant 8, and the phenotype of that is white eyes. Homozygous mutant for mutant one. And then these are just both both white. So that gives us a nine to seven. Uh, this kind of thing, this is called complementary gene action, where we're doing a cross involving two genes that um, give you the same phenotype by themselves. And so what we're saying is that there's a couple of steps to get from white to red and you need uh, gene 1 to, to do one step and gene 8 to do the other step. And so if you're blocked at either step or both steps you're stuck with white eyes. Now so far we, the gene 8 could be the first step and gene 1 could be the second step. There are some genetic ways to figure that out but um, we don't need to worry about that right now. Then we get into some three-point crossing. Uh, we'll do one of these. Um, well, one of them for now. And then I'll pause and come back later. Um, all right. 
So this is, so now we got three genes. We've got a fly, female fly that's heterozygous for all three. And this is trying to break this type of mapping cross down into uh, some, several steps. So the first thing is which ones are which? So these are the parents. And these will be the double crossovers. 